Hello, everybody. This is Tammy. Thank you for joining us once again this Thursday evening. And it's our Travel Abroad series. And I am so excited that Nikki is back with us. And this was um, picked by one of our members about um, to talk about St. Petersburg, Treasures of the Tsars. And um, when Nikki is ready, um, like I said, he is going to be here in the end of July talking about Amsterdam. And then he's going to uh, go on a cruise. And then he's actually going to be here in person in on November 16th. So stay tuned for that. So Nikki, thank you again. And I thank you everybody for coming and uh, stay again afterwards so we can ask a few questions. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you very much again, ladies and gentlemen, for inviting me to join you here again at Glen Eagles. Uh, you're hearing me okay, Tammy? Everything loud and clear? And yep. we've got our screen and we are recording. So we're ready to go. I think one of the most beautiful cities that, that I have ever visited in, in 39 years of, of cruising and traveling around the world is right there on the Baltic Sea, St. Petersburg in Russia. It's considered one of the most historic, one of the most scenic. It has a number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And I don't know if there's anything more fabulous than a few days in St. Petersburg. So we thought we'd like to do tonight is stamp your passports as we take off for Russia to have a look at this city on the Baltic that was the window to the west of Peter the Great, Peter the First. Where are we? Well, here we are at the eastern edge of the Gulf of Finland, where it empties into the Baltic Sea. And that is the city of St. Petersburg. Now, the interesting thing about it uh, to me is how much water is St. Petersburg? This is kind of a, a Venice of the North, it's called. The Neva River is the outflow of the Lake Deladoga takes you into the Gulf of Finland. And it's not anywhere near a long river. It's only about 46 miles from the lake at where it empties into the Gulf of Finland. But almost half of that length is in the city of St. Petersburg. 17 miles go through the town. That means there is a lot of water, a lot of canals, and necessarily a lot of bridges. How many canals? 65 of them. If you've been to St. Petersburg, and I'm sure many of you have, you've probably done one of the cruises on the canals. Now, Venice to the north, there's 150 canals in Venice. There's 65 of them, almost half of them, that many, right here in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg also has 400 bridges over these canals. Now, that's, again, just as many bridges as you find in the city of Venice. Now, they're not nearly as historic and beautiful as the ones you find in Venice. They are connectors. Now, with all of that water, there's naturally a lot of problems. About 118 years ago, they had some catastrophic flooding in the downtown part of the city. And then, just 18 years later, they had another, 1924, the record set of water, people paddling away, just like they do in Venice when they have the same problems there. The most recent one that was as catastrophic level was in 1967, about 22 years before the Soviet Union collapsed and it became Russia once again. Now, it's not always been St. Petersburg. It was founded as St. Petersburg, but then World War I came along, they changed it. Felt like it sounded too German, so they called it Petrograd, the city of Peter. In 1924, after Vladimir Lenin died, they changed it to honor Comrade Lenin. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed and became Russia once again, the Russian Federation as we know it today, one of the first things they did was to vote to change the name back to the original, St. Petersburg. And that's what we know the city as today. The city of Peter the Great, only 53 years old, but the man had a, an incredible life. He was the first of the, of, of the Peters there, Peter the First, he called Peter the Great, and he is the one who was only 31 years old when he founded this great city. The story of the founding and the city itself, I think is as interesting as are the sites that we find in St. Petersburg. Look at the family tree of the czars, goes back to the early part of the 15th century. Here's Peter the First, Peter the Great down here. He was the son of Alexis the First. Now Alexis had married twice. His first wife was Maria Miloslavna. And then with Maria, he would have three children. They would be the half brothers of Peter and sister Sophia when he married again, Natalia. Now Alexis, his father died in 1682 and that presented a huge problem because there would be now two claims to the throne, the Narishkina family and the Miroslavna family. Now, it wouldn't be just a matter that you settle in court or some legal wrangling. This would be one of the most brutal and one of the most bloody 
family settlements in history. And Peter was a witness to every bit of this. He and his half brother, who was only 10 years old at the time, were co -zars. Now his older half sister, Sophia, would be the regent until he would take control. Now during this time, he would be the one that would watch all of the murders, the back alleys, all of the things that were taking place when the two families were vying for position as to which would rule Russia. Friends and family members were outright murdered. This would affect Peter and it would really set the pattern for how he would rule Russia as a czar himself. Look at the look on his sister's face. She was, she looks open for business and she was very strict for Peter and his half brother. They were minors, but Peter was only 17 years old when they overthrew Sophia. And it wouldn't be a matter of just replacing her and taking the throne. He was going to torture and then execute over 1,200 people who might be remotely connected to Sophia and the people who were in power earlier. Again, having learned what was going on and how to handle that when he saw what his parents were doing. Now, Ivan would die, his half-brother, in 1696, so it's all Peter at that time. And he was a monster. Six foot eight inches tall, he was certainly the body of a giant. Many people felt he had a genius IQ, but certainly the tallest monarch in all of Europe. This was at a time 300 years ago when people weren't nearly as tall as they are today. And many of his biographers feel that he had a number of physical problems. One of them, maybe he suffered from epilepsy. We do know that he ruled over about 16% of the entire land area of the world at the time. Think of how much area that is but it was one of the most backward countries in the world at the time. His goal, which became his passion and his obsession, was to bring Russia out of the Dark Ages and begin its Westernization. The serfs of Russia had been freed. They were no longer slaves, but they were virtual slaves to the people who owned the land that they worked. They even had to have permission from their masters before they could even marry. So they were not anywhere near part of the European society, certainly not in the economy or the politics of what was taking place in Europe at the time. Europe dreamed of a great city as he pulled this country out of the dark ages. To do that, he looked out on the Baltic Sea and he said, this is where we have to have a window to the West. We have to have an army. We have to have a maritime Navy. He looked around, he would begin this great journey around Europe as many of the royal aristocracy did at the time to see what was there. And in his journey around Europe, his eyes were open to what people were doing and how they were part of modern society. This statue of him here in Amsterdam shows the importance that he would place on building a great navy. He realized that the British did, as the Dutch did, you have to have a great navy. The Dutch East India Company, one of the largest trade uh, empires at the time, the British East India Company, you have to have a great navy to do that. Now, to have a great navy, you've got to have a port from which that navy can operate. And looking at Russia, most of their land was on shores of the Arctic Ocean. They had one port, Archangel, up here on the White Sea, but it was virtually useless because it was iced over much of the year. He said, okay, we've got to have a window to the west. We have to have an ice-free port. The problem was the neighbors to the west, Sweden, were in control, firm control of the Baltic Sea from the middle of the 17th century. When he looked south, he saw the Ottoman Turks. They had taken Constantinople, the city in 1453, and expanded their empire northward into the Crimea, to Kiev, and southward to the Buddha of Arabia and in North Africa. So where am I going to have my ice-free port? You have to take a choice, not gonna be here on the Baltic Sea or here on the Black Sea, until certain things take place, we've gotta to go to war. And he would in both areas. The Great Northern War lasted for two decades there when he took on the great power of Sweden. Now, Russia didn't have a modern army, or great, but they had more men than you could throw into the ship, and that's exactly what they relied on. They would win that war after the battle. Of Nar and this is a very stylized painting of Peter leading his army. He's not really much of a leader for the army. But they won the Battle of Narva pretty soon. Sweden had been defeated up in the Baltic. The Swedish supremacy in the Baltic would end when the great part of that area that he needed, the states of, of the Baltic now, would be signed in 1721 with what is now Tallinn, Estonia, and Latvia and Lithuania, would be ceded to Russia. 
So now he's got some room up there. And then he looked south to the Black Sea and he would ally with the British and some of the other Europeans in this battle of Azov where he defeated the Ottoman Turks. So he had his choice, he chose the Baltic. He's gonna build his city right there on the Gulf of Finland where the Swedes had built a fortress before. Wasn't much of a fortress, but right there where the Neva River empties into the Gulf. The Swedish called it Nayenskans, okay? Peter would take it over and he found that they built that fort on the absolute worst spot they could find. It was a malarial swamp. Well, you're gonna build a great world-class city on a malarial swamp, but that was his goal. The man he chose was one of the great city planners of the day, Alexander Menshikov. And Menshikov became very busy working very closely with Peter, outlining what he wanted to do. Well, you've got to drain some of these swamps, but you're going to need an entire army to drain the swamps and to build this great city. Not a problem. He said, I've got the sixth of the world land area. I'll recruit workers from all over the Russian empire. And he did. These people had to go to work there. And it's estimated that as many as 200, maybe 250,000 men died, literally being worked to death and from the malaria that was endemic to that region. It would be called the city built on bones. It was the bones of the people who built that. But Peter didn't care. Many died. He had that many thousands more that he could throw into that. Now, you need a great fortress. And what he did was to build the fortress on an island right there in the Neva River. There would not be a single bridge until many years later. You've got a pretty much impregnable fortress. You've got to get to the fortress before an invading power could get there. So he had plenty of his serfs, plenty of the prisoners of war from Sweden to build this great fortress for him there. This is what it looks like today from the air. And you can see is a star diagram of a fortress. You don't build them in a circle. In a star, the way they had it here, you could bring much more firepower to an invading enemy. And those bridges that you see were very recent additions. There were no bridges to Vasilevsky Island. When condemned prisoners were sent out there, they weren't coming back. It was called the Deva Gate, the Neth Gate, condemned to die there. A couple of very interesting spots that we go to when we're visiting. This particular one is the great cathedral of St. Peter and Paul. And then very close to that is a much smaller but very important building right here. And that is the Grand Ducal Vault. That was built just before World War I began. And this became the burial spot of many of the czars and the czarinas and the royal family. Other people were buried there. When it's open, when we visit, we see where Dostoevsky was buried and he wrote Crime and Punishment and the Brothers Karamazov. And then shockingly, his own son, who you'll see in a moment, was tortured to the point where he was murdered by Peter himself when he was just 28 years old. Why would you torture and murder your own son? He did at least bury him there with the family. Now the city had been designed, planned. He would need a great architect to begin the building. And there he'd look for a man who was part Swiss and part Italian, who's one of the leading architects of his day, named Domenico Trezzini. And he would establish an architectural style that would even take his name. They became very good friends and they were building this and he would see exactly what you're gonna do. He said, here on this fortress in the Neva River, we're gonna look over here to the north bank, the right bank of the Neva, and there is where we're gonna build your great city with these beautiful, beautiful stone houses. The design there that, that Tetrazzini built, called the Petrine Baroque design. And to make sure that he had enough people working and the very best people working, Peter would issue a royal edict so that no stone edifices outside St. Petersburg are to be constructed while this great city is being built. All of the great stonemasons from around the empire are gonna be brought to St. Petersburg and there they're gonna be put to work building all of the beautiful palaces that the city would hold, the grand design. You have to have a place to live while they're building your great palaces. So how about a 28 room summer house that he would live in? This today is part of the university there. St. Petersburg University uh, would have a number of very famous graduates, some of the alumni. This is the last bit of what was built during that time, the Petrine era. Now they would have eight Nobel laureates who were alumni, along with Latimer Lennon, all graduated from this university in St. Petersburg, premier in its day. Now for 16 years, it would be the capital of Russia. What about Moscow? Nope, St. Petersburg. Peter wanted his great city to be the capital of the empire, and it would be. It would be from 1712 until 1728. 
to make sure that the aristocracy were going to be there. Many of them didn't want to go there. They knew it was a, a swamp. They required to live at least six months out of the year in St. Petersburg. And they were going to take the ways of the West. If you're going to keep your beard, which all the Russians have, you're going to pay a tax on the beard. You're going to dress in Western style. You're going to learn to speak French, which is the language of the internationals of the day, official language of the court. There would not just be one palace, there's going to be a winter palace built, there'd be another winter palace built, the summer palace was there. It's the great palace in the summer of Peterhof, that is probably the leading tourist draw in all of St. Petersburg, that is the Versailles of the, of the area. And it is magnificent, especially when you look at when it was built in the early part of the 18th century. All of the fountains, all of the beautiful area, and it's not there in downtown St. Petersburg. Here is St. Petersburg. Here, over here at the entrance to the Gulf of Finland is where Peterhof was built. You get away from that in the summer. It's a swampy area. That's where he would be having his summers. Peter the Great began in 1714 and nothing was gonna be spared. Nothing was gonna be overlooked. The Tsarina Elizabeth would add to what Peter was doing with all of her finishing touches, all of the beautiful gardens, all of the pathways, the Grand Cascade, look at this bit of waterfalls. Again, this is the technology that they had 300 years ago when they're building this. The sculptures, the 64 pounds, 142 jets. Again, no electricity powering this. This is all in the architectural engineering of how these fountains and jets were operating. The Great Palace and the Upper Gardens are considered, again, comparable to Versailles in Paris. And it really was. You're not going to attend church with everybody else. You have a very special Russian Orthodox Church for the royal family. I'm going to talk a minute about this Russian Orthodox Church and the onion-shaped dome and the little unique crucifix that is on top of each of these edifices. This is what it looked like in World War II, heavily bombed during the time. Most of that beauty was destroyed. Well, what do you do? Well, you rebuild it, and they rebuilt it to this, exactly what it was prior to the destruction of World War II. Again, bringing in all the number of people you need from the what was the Soviet Union at the time, rebuild it as grand as it was when Peter and Tsarina Elizabeth were building the original. So you get to see it as it was. Touring the interior is equally impressive. It looks like the Tsar and his family are just getting ready to sit down at a gold-seated dinner right there in the royal dining area. It's been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. When any building or city or bridge or any part of the world becomes more important to the world than just to the area, United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO lists it as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And Peterhof is certainly that. This is the Russian Orthodox Church. They founded it in 1721. And there is that unique look of a crucifix. They have the vertical and the horizontal cross pieces like they do in the other Christian churches. But look there at the bottom, that diagonal piece, supposedly where the feet of Christ were nailed to it. Now, Peter was concerned that many people, the, the men at the time, were going to be opting out of serving in his army by joining the church, become monks or priests. Well, he solved that problem. He said no Russian man under 50 years old could join a monastery. Not going to have any draft dodgers. Clash of personalities would be between Peter and his son. No two men could have been more different than Peter and Alexei. Now, Peter, of course, was, was adamant about building this great city, about going to war with his neighbors to establish whatever he needed. Alexei was just the opposite. He was the dove. He didn't care about St. Petersburg. He didn't care about all this magnificence that his father was building there. He said, when I'm czar, I shall bring back the old people and choose myself new ones according to my will. When I become sovereign, I shall live in Moscow and leave St. Petersburg as any other town. Well, that incensed his father. And here it was his life's work to build this great city. It got worse when Alexei would continue. He said, I won't launch any ships. I shall maintain troops only for defense and I won't make war on anyone. Well, Peter said, we've got to change that. He said, that's how I got to power is by making war. Finally, Alexis would seal his own doom. He said, I'll be content with the old domain in winter I shall live in Moscow and summer in Laroslav. Well, Peter said, well, that's it. That's it. He realized that Alexei couldn't live under his father's rule and Alexei understood it as well. He said, I'm going to Europe. He said, I'm taking off and I'm going to Europe. Peter not only was heartbroken that his son wasn't gonna follow in his footsteps, he was insulted. 
Here is the son of the czar, the, the crown prince taking off for Europe and not going to come back. Well, Peter would send word to him. He said, if you will come back, we'll wipe the slate clean. All will be forgiven. Well, Alexei made the mistake of taking his father at his word. He did come back, and the first thing he did was he throw him in prison, accuse him of sedition. He said that he was trying to overthrow Peter. He would have him whipped. He would have him tortured repeatedly. Under torture, he renounced his claim to the, well, if you're being tortured, you'll tell him exactly what you want to hear. But the torture didn't continue. In 1718, in June, he would have over two dozen strokes from the lash. That pretty much opened his back up, and he never healed from that. After he had 15 more applied just a week later, it pretty much finished Alexei, and he died, whipped and tortured to death under orders of his father. It didn't stop with just Alexei. He would go after his mother. He's going to have, and this is an interesting name, Eudoxia is where you'd anglicize it. In Greek and in the Russian, Evdokia is where they pronounce it. Well, she was charged as well, sent off to a monastery where she would send the rest of her life, and that wasn't even enough for Peter. Anyone remotely connected to her is going to be tortured and executed as well. This guy was not letting up. He learned well when the two families that he was involved with were fighting over the throne. He did exactly the same thing. Finally, 1725, he died. But look his legacy, what he left St. Petersburg. He transformed what was said to be a heap of villages linked together like some slave plantation in the West Indies into a wonder of the world, considering the many palaces that were there. And it's exactly right. Certainly the man had his faults, but he did what he did in St. Petersburg. There would be a Catherine the First, and then there would be a Catherine the Great following Peter. Now she would be the one who would really do the, the touching finishings there onto St. Petersburg and to the many palaces there. It was under Catherine II when what would then be called the Hermitage attained its greatest glory. Catherine would build the very first bridge. They don't have any worry about Sweden being a power that's going to attack them anymore. So they built a bridge over to the island, first bridge over the Neva River. There would be many more. And then when Tsarina finished what she was doing to remodel it in this palace, it would be the, the Catherine II who would really add the great glory there. She's the one who first called it the Hermitage and added so many of the treasures that we see. Not just one little palace. Look at the complex. There's a palace, there's an opera house, and there is a museum. Now, it's as long as, as a couple of football fields, 100 feet high. And where do you stop? How much is enough? They made sure that it was the crowning jewel of the city because no structure anywhere in the city was allowed to be higher than where they were here. 1,500 rooms. Well, think how busy the people were cleaning. How about the window washer? Over 1,900 windows to keep clean. Almost 1,800 doors. How much is enough? Realize that this is the small throne room. What can the large throne room look like? Again, they spared no expense. There, all the money that, that they had was spent on this. Didn't worry about the serfs and the misery that they were living under. Just so the grand glory of the czars and the czarinas. Here's the armorial hall. Crystal chandeliers hanging from every gold vaulted ceiling. Floors that were spit shine. You could eat off of them, he said. This Jordan staircase is supposed to be one of the most magnificent in all of Europe. And it, when that area is open, people just want to have a picture of exactly that. Art. And here is where she would excel. All of the masters there, six different collections from Rembrandt, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Rubens, Titian, Raphael. How much art is enough? All of the different sculptors, all of these artworks were brought there. I asked one of the guides one time when we were taking our tour groups there. She said, how much is there? Do you really know? She said, we don't know. She said, we really don't know. It's cataloged. But if you were to spend 30 seconds in front of every piece of art in this museum, it would take you, look, 11 years to see it all. Now think how many 30 seconds there are in 11 years. You won't see all of the Hermitage in two, three, four, seven days. It takes years to see it all. Well, it would be the residence all the way up until the Russian Revolution of 1917. A couple of times they thought about moving it, especially when what happened to this man. Alexander II was the last one to be a permanent resident there. And what changed his mind? Well, they tried to kill him. It was bombed. Some anarchists there would track him and try to assassinate the man through a bomb that destroyed much of it. Well, it was immediately repaired to its former glory. 
In front there is Palace Square, and this is another UNESCO World Heritage Site. It shows why St. Petersburg is called the city of three revolutions and the cradle of the Russian Revolution, which changed the empire into the Soviet Union in 1917. The Alexander Column, okay, this is the great victory monument. 700 tons of this granite was brought and placed over here after the victory over Napoleon. Again, so grand and glorious that UNESCO has declared it a world heritage site as well. Now, Catherine I would go outside town to build her dream palace in the summertime. This is not Catherine II, this is Catherine I. Pushkin, where is Pushkin? Okay, here is Pushkin at the southeast end of the great glorious city today. Catherine II would come along after the first and Tsarina Elizabeth, and she would add to it as well. And this is really a, for people who have a little more time, they'll extend their visit to go out to Pushkin to see the glorious design of everyone in Europe who was called in to work on this particular palace. Why the city of three revolutions? Well, the very first one was in December of 1825. And it was an attempt by the army to overthrow the Tsar. The army troops didn't feel that the Tsar Nicholas I was the rightful heir to the throne. They felt it would be another man, Constantine, his brother. Didn't happen, didn't happen. We would see it right here in Senate Square, which is just down the street from the great palaces, uh, where that took place. And that's a statue of Peter on a huge rock monument in the middle of Senate Square, which would for a while be called December Square. And there would be the revolution attempted in 1905. It would be called Bloody Sunday. And this is really one of the, the centerpieces of what would lead to the Russian Revolution 12 years later. What happened is a Russian Orthodox priest, Father Gapon, would lead a group of unarmed union workers. They were going to petition Nicholas II right here in front of this huge arch that we'll be talking about later on to redress their grievances. They had a lot of grievances. Of course, they were the the serfs, the, the worst treated of all of the different people in Europe, the peasants of Europe, none of them had it as bad as the serfs of Russia. They wanted to talk to the czar. They're going to petition him with a number of grievances. We need to end this war that we're waging right now with Japan. Russia was being humiliated in this Russo-Japanese. How can a small island nation like Japan soundly defeat Russia? They were doing that because the Russian army, as large as it was, was poorly led and poorly equipped. Japan was all over them. So we need to end this war. We need to have universal suffrage. We're not allowed to vote. We need to shorten our working day and get fair wages and better working conditions for the working people. This is what we want to present to the Tsar. Well, they would be met by the sabers of the Royal Guard, the Cossacks. Estimated up to 5,000 were killed. The Tsars would say there was about 400. That would lead up to World War I, 1914. Europe would go to war in August of 1914. The United States would not enter until April of 1917. But 70 million men would be sent off to their destinies. And guess what? They were sent by three cousins. The triple entente would be the Russians, the British, and the French allied against the central powers, Germany, Austro-Hungarian Empire. It would be Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. Now those... 70 million men would be sent by these three cousins. There was King George V of England. This is the grandfather of Queen Elizabeth today. His cousin, a royal marriage, was Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. And his cousin by royal marriage was Tsar Nicholas II. So 70 million men went off to war. 39 million would become casualties. And they were all sent off by these three men. The amazing thing to me is how similar they look. This is the Tsar and King George V of England. They look almost like twin brothers. They could be almost twins. They look so similar. St. Petersburg, well, they're going to change the name. That's more Germanic sounding, and it was. So they named it Peter City in Russia, Petrograd, and it would remain that way now. Russia then would be humiliated in this war just as they were in the war against Japan. Everywhere the Russian troops were fighting, they were being rolled back by the troops of, the, of Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Poorly led, poorly equipped, Russian people were demanding a change. These defeats would be what bring down the royal family. There were two men who were responsible for being the leading voices against what was happening in the Russian war, in World War I. Leon Trotsky and Vladimir Lenin. They were passionate about pulling Russia out of this war. 
They would be the ones who would be the linchpins for the Russian Revolution, which ended three centuries of the Romanov family. Peter the Great's family, Nicholas II's family, all were Romanovs. It began right here on the Neva River in St. Petersburg, not anywhere else in Russia, but right there in St. Petersburg on this Russian battle cruise of the Aurora. It was on an October day in 1917 when the captain and the crew were ordered to sea and begin their war against Germany. They had been badly beaten up until this now. The crew decided we're not going. They're not going. They fired a shot, which was a signal for the Russian people to begin an assault on the Winter Palace and the royal family. And that cruiser is a museum piece today. It's right there on the Neva River in St. Petersburg. We take our groups to visit there, and it is a shrine for the Russian people. And the very next day, Lenin is addressing the Second Congress of the Soviets. And he's telling them, we've got to end this war. We're going to create a separate peace, not involving the other allies. We're going to withdraw. And they did. A unilateral peace pulled Russia out of the war. And in March of 1918, about six months before the war would end in November of that year, Russia pulled out. The fighting would not continue. They're looking at what's happening. Okay, 1918, Petrograd, we felt was too close to Germany. Better to move it to Moscow, which is a little further away from what the fighting that was still taking place. So the capital then is going to be moved to Moscow, no longer in St. Petersburg. The nagging problem is what do you do with the royal family? They had been under house arrest for about a year now. You've got Tsar Nicholas and his wife. You've got the four daughters. And you've got the little boy there at the Tsar's knee, Alexei. Now, he had been born with hemophilia, or was suffering with his blood disease. Now, Russia was at war with itself, fighting against Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire had stopped, but the whites were fighting against the Reds. St. Petersburg would figure prominently in that fighting. It would be what's going to happen to the Russian royal family. At 1.30 in the morning on July the 17th of 1918, under orders of Vladimir Lenin, the czar, his wife, four daughters, and the son would be rounded up, ordered into the basement, and they would have an execution squad that was ordered to kill them. Now, they knew they couldn't get the Russian soldiers to do it, so they had the Hungarian soldiers who were rushed with them, and they were the ones who pulled the trigger, killed all of the Russian family at the time. So they're gone. Now, Russia's out of the war, but the suffering still is continuing the Reds and the Whites, until finally the Reds would win that war, and it would be the Soviet Union that would come about at the time. Now, Comrade Lenin died in 1924, five years after World War I ended, and the peace treaty was signed in 1919. So they're going to change the name of St. Petersburg again. They're going to name it after Lenin. They're going to call it Leningrad now. We would see, just like New York City, the establishment of five boroughs. And there, all of the people who had fled during this Civil War time are being urged to return. And that urge would be tempered by this man. Joseph Stalin was coming to power at this time in the Soviet Union. And for the next 31 years, he would lead the Soviet Union in this great terror that he instituted. There would be a wholesale slaughter of people executed or sent off to the gulags where they would be literally worked to death. The gulags then would be followed by the great purge. You're gonna get rid of anyone who's not blooded Russian, all the Germans, the Latvians, the Estonians, all the people bordering on the Baltic Sea are going to be booted out. You're going to have to find another place to live. We want the Russia for the Russians. Then we would see under Stalin's rise, the rise of fascism in Italy and the Nazi party in Germany. The world is once again on a trajectory towards war. Now, Russia decided, uh, Soviet Union, I'm sorry, decided to ally themselves with Germany. In August of 1939, just a week before the war would begin, the Russian ambassador Molotov would meet with the German ambassador Ribbentrop and sign a mutual defense treaty. Now, the Soviet Union is now secure. Stalin felt secure having his eastern his flank over there, and Hitler felt secure. His flank in the east is covered by Stalin. So now it's time to go to war, and Hitler would order the invasion of Poland at the end of August 31st of 1939. Two weeks later, Soviet Union would join the war. They invaded Poland. We would see at that time Hitler planning to turn on his ally, and it would happen the following year. 
The Allies would part ways when Hitler ordered what would be called Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union by Germany. This was their ally before, now they're going to war against them. And St. Petersburg, now Leningrad, would figure very prominently in that fighting. I mean, no city has been damaged as heavily anywhere in the world as what took place here for almost three years. 872 days, people suffered like no other people would be suffering. Starvation would ramp at the time. A million and a half died, almost that many more evacuated with people eating dogs, cats, rats, even tales of cannibalism. Here's an officer going around in the morning just picking up the number who had died the night before. Where do you find water? Well, they were trying to break into any water lines they could find. Imagine how terrible their winters are anyway, and there when you're starving through those winters. Remember the diary of Anne Frank in Amsterdam? Here, this is a similar diary about a little Russian girl who wrote her similar experiences during the great siege of Leningrad. But Leningrad held, and it would be a turning point and the Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia, would be Hitler's downfall. After World War II ended, there would be a tremendous building boom in St. Petersburg. If you've been to their metro system, it is one of the finest in all of Europe today. Again, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Boris, Boris Yeltsin was elected president. And one of the very first things they did afterwards was a predominant number of voters, 54%, voted to change the name Leningrad back to the original St. Petersburg. The same day, the very first democratically elected mayor of St. Petersburg would take office. We've got six million people in that metro area now, and they rank number four among all the cities in Europe in terms of size. We've got Moscow, London, and Istanbul ahead of them. Now, it is the northernmost city in all the world with at least one million people. There is St. Petersburg. If you look to the west, you'll find Helsinki, you find Oslo, you find Stockholm, slightly less than a million in their metropolitan area. When our cruise ships come in there, here's where we'll stop, right at the entrance to the very first bridge over the Neva River. And there, luckily, is where most of the great sites that we want to see, we want to show you right now, are located. Here's the first one, the Church of the Savior on Spilled Blood. Now, this is more of a museum piece than it ever was a church. Beautiful, and especially the location right there with all those little onion domes in the heart of town on one of the canals. It was consecrated in 1881 and it moved to this man. Now, Alexander II mentioned they had tried to kill him in the palace. They didn't try there. They tried again here when he was on a, in a carriage going along the canal. Now, anarchists threw a bomb that didn't kill him. But instead of being whisked away to a secure place, he jumped out of his carriage and went to confront the man who tried to kill him. Well, that was his mistake. One of the other assassins would be the men who finished the job in killing Alexander II. Now, his son then would be the one who would decide, we're going to build a great edifice to my father. To take place from 1881 is when they began it, continuing on into the 20th century. And this monument to his father was more of a museum piece and a, and a monument than it ever was a church. They never had church services, the Russian Orthodox Church, the weddings or funerals were held there. Today, it is a museum piece, and here is where people flock to see mosaics on the outside as well as on the inside. 70,000 square feet of mosaics. The high point there, the crucifix at the top, is almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty, 265 feet over the canal right there. All of the great marble from Italy, from Norway, from granite, brought all over Europe to make this beautiful edifice there when it was opened. They opened it just uh, still prior to the Soviet Union becoming Russia. Went through a 20 year restoration and it is magnificent inside. I think more magnificent even than this church. This is the largest cathedral. This is St. Isaac's. This is the biggest one in Russia. It's a short uh, ride away from there. But just as we saw building St. Petersburg, how many hundreds of people died in the construction of this great edifice? Again, the Czar didn't care. They had thousands more to throw into it. Look at the Golden Dome, 300,000 tons. 26 of these marble columns all around there, made from the beautiful granite from Finland. Now, during the Soviet era days, it was an atheist country. So this is the Museum of Atheism. There wouldn't be religious services held there. 
Now, it's great that much of the art has been preserved. And with the collapse of communism, now they are doing worship services there on part of the interior. Just on feast days there, the different feasts of the saints in the Russian Orthodox Church, will they have the main body of the cathedral open. And you look at the magnificent stained glass windows, and you think of the damage to St. Petersburg during the siege in World War II, it's amazing how they were able to save so much of that along with all of the jewels and stones that were whisked away for safekeeping. Now we look at the ceiling, you remind a little of St. Peter's there, how magnificent it is, 8,700 square feet in the cupola. This is the Astoria Hotel, nothing famous about that except that balcony right there in the center. That is where Adolf Hitler said that he was going to stand when he would watch the German troops march through downtown St. Petersburg, as he did when he watched them march through downtown Paris. Of course, he never did. But that is the most famous hotel with its balcony right there. It's uh, right here on their Broadway. Nevsky Prospect is the big shopping area. It's a six lane highway right in the heart of downtown St. Petersburg. Three miles long, yeah, it is quite the show. What reminds you of the Vatican and the great cathedral there is this one. Our Lady of Kazan dates to the early part of the 19th century with the design inspired by St. Peter's Cathedral in the Vatican. And this is where a miracle icon, people supposed to have touched this icon and were healed of different maladies there. The Bolsheviks uh, seized it in 1917 during the revolution, uh, but it has been reopened for services now and they do have Russian Orthodox services taking place there. Everyone wants to attend a performance at the Marinsky Theater. This was the Tsar's wife here, Alexander II's wife, Maria, uh, would have this great palace built. And this is where all of the stars are, the Mariski, the Kirov Ballet, they would take the name. And that's where we see Nuriyev, Barishnikov, all performing there. And when we're there, of course, we want to visit. This is the arch we talked about before, the Narva Triumphal Arch. This was built as a memorial to the Russians who died defeating Napoleon. 1814 victory over Napoleon. The following year, he was banished and sent off to St. Helen. Now, the last of the great castles then that would serve as a residence was the Mikhailovsky Castle. Paul I was the czar who would be in residence there, but he wasn't there for long. Just a little after a month, he moved in, he was murdered. It's a revolving door for many of these czars with the people that did want to murder them. But it would be the last of the great castles there that served as a palace consecrated in 1800. So with all of these great palaces, all of the great history, all of the magnificent architecture in this beautiful city with the midnight sun in the summertime, the sun never just dips below the horizon at these far northern latitudes. It is just a, a overall magnificent experience visiting St. Petersburg. And what I'd like to do now is close with some images that I've collected over a number of visits to St. Petersburg and hope that you will enjoy some of the music and some of these images that we want to look at. Gotta have your McDonald's. Gotta have dessert at Baskin Robbins.
So we threw a lot at you in the last 45 minutes, but I hope you enjoyed that uh, ramble through St. Petersburg, one of the great cities of the world. Uh, if you would like to unmute yourselves now, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. I know I threw a lot at you in the last, was it 47 minutes? But if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them for you. I have no question, but I want to thank you for this wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you you know, it, br it brings back to mind about 40 years ago, my husband and I got a phone call from our accountant who was Russian. He asked us to join him on a uh, luxury liner called SS Leningrad. Yes. Which was given uh, going on its maiden voyage to, to Leningrad. And this the accountant of arts who was Russian was born in Leningrad. Amazing. And of course, now I regret not having taken that cruise, but my husband was not interested at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yellow, and you got it yellow gold. Oops. What a magnificent experience that that had to have been. Uh, it, it just really, there's so many things there you can't ever see everything that's there. We had the, the very good fortune to, very first time I sailed into St. Petersburg to have on board a world-class balalaika player. And the music that you hear from Zhivago and these others, yeah. the national instrument, the balalaika, uh, was just magic to, to hear Laura's theme played as you enter or leave St. Petersburg. It's, it's just really- Perfect, magic. perfect. Have you ever heard of the ship SS Leningrad at all? I had heard of it. Uh, a good friend of mine is a, histor a maritime historian. And he, I think he has some more information on it. I don't, uh, I have not seen the ship or know any other than what he told me about it, that it was uh, in its day, that was the, uh, the beautiful vessel. I see. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, hope you enjoyed the program as much as Oh, I very much so, excellent. This is Greenberger. Yes, I'd like to know in that picture, uh, group of pictures you just showed us there was a very contemporary very tall yes. piece what is that that is now a part of a new museum piece it is a multi-purpose building there is um shopping in there i understand it. i've never been uh, in it uh the you have to be a, you have to program to get in there but uh, i understand that there also are apartments in there as well hmm. but it is uh, primarily the museum let's see if i can here. Here, I think that's the one uh, that you're talking about right there. You have to, um, you have to share. Yes, right, right there on the river. And you have to share your screen. They, they have a, 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 you can go all the way to the very top. Uh, now, yes, I'm Did sorry. You share, you, didn't, you have to share your screen. Okay, let me go back to that. So we can see what you're talking about. And then Mrs. Uh, the Mrs. Rhoda, after this, you can have your question. So I think that's the that's the building you're talking about. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yes, it is open uh, and, and it is a multi use um, facility there. The strange thing is they have so much parking. I, I was shocked to see park. You never find parking in these areas. Uh, but the people and understand that there are apartments as well. I can't imagine what they must pay for an apartment there in, in something like How's that. How's that on the Neva also? Yes, yes. This is Rhoda, do you, uh, did you have a question? I'm just not sure. Uh, Mr. Caden, I, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Nikki, I, I wonder if you'd comment, uh, you were speaking before about um, the starvation in what was then Leningrad during the war. And of course you mentioned Lake Ladoga and the river. Um, I remember reading the importance of uh, the ability of them to send food over the lake and the river when it was frozen, it was tremendous hardship. But from what I understand, that was what ultimately saved the city from ultimate starvation. It absolutely did. And the importance of the saving the city uh, is, is really amplified here, along with uh, some of the other areas there. When, when we're looking at, at Stalingrad, uh, thousands were dying there. They turned, it was the bloodiest battle of the entire uh, Russian campaign. But had the Allies not been able to get the northern convoys going over into the Arctic, 
and coming down through Lake Ladoga and then the frozen river, uh, those people probably would have, have gone under and had the German troops occupied Leningrad, then it might have been a, an entirely different outcome in, the, in the, the Russian part of the war. Right. And I understand that they really didn't know for sure whether they were going to be successful in, in doing that because of the extreme uh, conditions there and the fact that they just didn't know if the river would freeze over, uh, not the river, but the lake, the lake. would freeze over sufficiently to be able to handle uh, the equipment and the weight of the food supplies that they had to use to get in there. Sure. Uh, one, one statistic that I uh, remember from uh, reading about it and studying it when we were there is that at the opening of the campaign against Russia, the Germans just rolled the Russian troops back. They were losing 46,000 men a day. Now, think of those numbers. We've got 58,000 names on the Vietnam Wall over 15 years of involvement in Southeast Asia. This is 46,000 in a day the Russians were losing. So the importance of of Leningrad, the importance of Stalingrad to hold out against this, this massive German army that was just steamrolling its way across Russia, uh, it just can't be overemphasized. And the, the little girl's diary, if you want some fascinating reading, a translation of that little girl's diary who wrote what it was like to live under those conditions where you could find a dog, you would eat the dog or a cat or rat, or like this. it's just hard for us to, to imagine something like that. Yeah, the, actually, the book, uh, The Siege of Leningrad, uh, yeah. 900 Days, The Siege of Leningrad, is uh, really tremendously interesting in uh, exploring the hardships and the, the strategy of what they had to go through. Yeah, it's a treasure. It is. Um, Mrs. Shore, did you have a question? You are unmuted. Well, uh, thank you. Well, the, uh, the Siege of Leningrad is very interesting to me because we took a trip on the Black Sea about five years ago, and in Odessa, there's a magnificent building on the roof. Someone has built up the whole uh, of, Mos of Leningrad and the, the war and, the, and all the soldiers on both sides. And they have a woman that was almost Shakespearean in her speech to talk about how much it meant to, uh, to defeat the Germans and, uh, and what it cost them. And, I, her voice was amazing and so that they remember that well and it's uh, the country survived because of that. You were very fortunate to have heard something like that. I, I can imagine how moving that must have been uh, to, to experience that, especially right there where you were. It was amazing, especially she sounded almost like an actress, you know, from the early theater days when they spoke so perfectly. Oh. And so strongly about each move they made and to have all this in front of you to see exactly the way the movements were. It was amazing. Thank you. Mrs. Rubenstein, you unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? No, I don't. Nope. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have a question? You can, Mrs. Greenberger again. Yes. Yes, we were very fortunate in seeing an opera while we were there, but I was very surprised to find the uh, captions above the stage were in English. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there, there are so many English speaking visitors from across Europe, from across the United States, from elsewhere that, that visit, that I think that was a, um, a surprise to a lot of people, not just to you, to see, be have a caption there and see what, and actually hear and see what they are saying. Right. I hope you weren't there in the winter time. That, that's the coldest I think I've ever been. No, we've we been, were there in the summer. Yeah, everybody goes in the, in the summer or late summer, especially if spring is, is, is uh, still can be pretty cold. But their season is like Alaska there. It's, it's uh, middle of May till about middle of September. Um, and then they get some very, very serious weather there. We've, five contracts I've had in Antarctica. I, I think I was colder up there in, in, in St. Petersburg in the winter than I was in Antarctica in the summer. Thank you. Um, Nikki, we have, again, everybody, uh, we have Nikki coming back at the end of Ju July, July 29th, I believe. Yes. Do you want to give a, I'm, sometimes you have slides, but if you don't, did you just want to tell people what you're going to talk about um, in July? Yes. Or this, the, the, the Queen City of the North Sea, we're looking at, at Amsterdam, and we'll look at, again, like with St. Petersburg, much of the history 
uh, there of the city. How it became that one tower that you see there, and it's on the tourist trail, probably anyone who's visited Amsterdam saw that, is the tower from which the women waved goodbye to their men, Henry Hudson included, when they sailed away from the Netherlands on their voyages of exploration to the New World and then on around the tip of, of Africa and in South America as well into these unexplored lands. So we'll be looking at Amsterdam and how it developed, uh, many of the tourist attractions in Amsterdam and just what a glorious city it is. Uh, every bit as, as much of a the canals, the, the bicycles. I mean, they have gigantic, been there, we'll just do the, the entire visit there to Amsterdam to see how it developed. And especially to show you some images of what it's like in the spring, tulip time. Eight billion, think of this, eight billion tulip bulbs are coming of age about that time, each of them inspected by the government of the Netherlands before they're shipped around the world. In the world's largest flower market, about eight football fields in size. So we'll be looking at the, the gardens there, we'll be looking at the flower auction, uh, the interesting way they do an auction, it's a timed auction. And the, the great beauty, uh, many times when we visit there, we're doing a bicycle trip through the area. And you kind of strain to keep your eye on the bike path when you've got all these thousands of acres, much of it reclaimed from the North Sea, just awash in the different colors of the tulips at the time. So I think you'll enjoy the, the program there on Amsterdam, a little bit of its history and its culture and its great scenery. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed your Thursday night. And um, happy 4th of July. I will see a few of you hopefully um, on Sunday the 4th. We have our barbecue dinner as well as we do have some music and dancing with uh, DJ Mike Perry. And uh, then the following Tuesday, if you have any Android questions, we're gonna have our Tech Tuesdays at 4.30 with myself and some people from the uh, Computer Club where we're gonna talk about your um, Android basics. And then um, Joel Guntz returns for our film camp on um, Thursday, um, the following that Thursday. So we're excited to keep all of the um, entertainment and the virtual lectures coming to you over the summer. And if there's something that you want to uh, learn about, you can just email me. And uh, I appreciate you, everybody. And I, I hope you have a great fourth and a great summer. And what about Happy Canada Day? And, and Canada, oh, check out, I do have the gentleman, a president of Earth Day from Pierre, uh, Pierre Lusseter. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, from Canada. And he is actually going to come on Zoom and speak to my Canadians and the rest of our members. Yeah, but today is Canada Day. Canada well, happy Canada Day to everybody today, right? That's it. Exactly. Well, I'm glad that we both have Independence Days in the same, right? Is it an Independence Day? Yeah, it's our birthday. And you're wearing red, white. Is that, those are the colors. I see that now. All right. Well, I do apologize for not wishing everybody a happy Canada Day. Well, you have a few of us Canadians. <laughs> I know there is. Mrs. Slover's on here as well. I mean, anybody else from Canada? Oh, there's the Goldbergs. Happy Canada Day. And I do. And, and it's recorded. So I, <laughs> I will apologize now. I'm going to stop the recording. Tammy, <laughs>